like to greet each and every one of you. And uh, I think I uh, also follow uh, the step of riding on uh, the protocols which we are very well outlined by you, the director, and the Dr. Stephen Karim. And I would like to indicate that uh, as I stand before you this morning, I'm also speaking on behalf of the Chief Executive Officer of Audane Party, Madam Nados Bekele Thomas. Right now, as I'm speaking, she is in the Permanent Representative Committee meeting, which is preparing for the meetings of the Executive Council and the Assembly of the African Union Heads of State and Government. I should have been in that meeting. I'll be joining them later tonight, and possibly after this meeting, I could also join online, actually after the open ceremony. The UN system and the African Union have been collaborating since the attainment or the establishment of the Organization of African Unity. That collaboration would be enhanced with the establishment of the college to college meetings and the participation of the African Union as a permanent member of the G20. At the level of the G20, there are what are called knowledge partners, such as the International Monetary Fund, World Bank, ILO, the International Trade Center, World Trade Organization, UNCTAD, among several others. So we've also recommended that at the level of the African Union, on the continent, we should have our own knowledge partners. And we've identified UNECA to be among our knowledge partners. In the spirit of the theme, towards an African continental free trade implementation peer learning community, I would like to share some of our contributions in the implementation of the agreement and protocols establishing the African continental free trade area. I begin by saying that after delivery of the African continental free trade area, two of the early tasks we performed was to not find the World Intellectual Property Organization, WIPO, and the World Trade Organization, WTO, on the establishment of the African continental free trade area. In the case of WIPO, the objective was to safeguard its brand as a distinct trademark. In the case of the WTO, the objective was to register it as a regional trade agreement. Shortly after the launch of the operational phase of the African Continental Free Trade Area, our sister organization, Auda Nepal, published research results on conditions for success in the implementation of the agreement establishing the African Continental Free Trade Area. The insights and results of that study are still very much useful. And I urge stakeholders, especially those in this meeting, to refer to it from time to time as we implement the agreements and protocols of the African Continental Free Trade Area. In 2018, the Assembly adopted the protocol on free movement of people, right of residence, and right of establishment. This protocol is still undergoing signature and ratification. Once more, I call on member states to sign and ratify the protocol. And doing so is going to remove formidable non-tariff barriers in the implementation of the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement and consequently facilitate increased intra-African trade flows. 
Growth of the African economy is one of the key success factors of the African continent of Ritadria. The African economy grew at 3.8% in 2023. The projected growth rate for 2024 is 4%. With Asia projected to grow at 4.9%, Africa will be the second high growth region in the world in 2024. With a view to raising and sustaining the continent's investments and growth rate, we have teamed up with the African Development Bank, Aouda Nepad, and ourselves on a study on key actions to achieve inclusive growth and sustainable development across Africa. The idea is to see if we can position African countries to grow at rates of 7 to 10% per annum of a period of 30 years or more, and also raise investment rates from the current level of 20% of GDP to 40%. We're also in the process of establishing a debt monitoring mechanism in the face of the emerging unsustainability of the debt levels of our member states. They are unsustainable in the sense that they cannot be paid or repaid on time and in full. If a debt crisis emerges across Africa, it is going to erode fiscal spaces and the capacities of state parties to implement the agreement establishing the African continent of free trade area, among other public investments. In addition, we are in the G20 advocating for reform of the G20 mechanism on debt treatments with a view to ensuring that it delivers timely debt restructuring. The African continent of Ritaria is a launchpad for deeper continental integration. And in this respect, we have embarked on studies on red assessment towards an African customs union slash common market. And one of the studies is being undertaken by the African Trade Policy Center. And we plan to roll out the studies before the end of this year. We're also involved in the establishment of African financial institutions. And these are the African Central Bank, the African Investment Bank, the African Monetary Fund, and the African Stock Exchange. In 2022, the AU Assembly adopted a recommendation from the President of the African Development Bank to commission a study on the establishment of an African financial stability mechanism. Work is ongoing on this project. Following the adoption of the macroeconomic convergence criteria by the Assembly in 2021, we're now mobilizing funds and facilitating the adoption of the statutes to lead us to the establishment and operationalization of the African Monetary Institute in Abuja, Nigeria. The institutes will monitor move movement towards macroeconomic convergence, a primary condition for an African common currency and central bank. With respect to the Pan-African Stock Exchange, we are working with the African Stock Exchange Association to operationalize it as a virtual platform. We signed in July 2022 with the Af Association of African Stock Exchanges a memorandum of understanding. And this led to the launch of an Africa Exchanges Linkage Project, AELP, in November 2022. There are nine participating African stock exchanges in the AELP, which we aim to upscale and transform into the Pan-African Stock Exchange. The importance of these financial institutions in the African continent of Ritadria lies in them offering platforms for policy harmonization, economic stability, domestic resource mobilization, 
and, among others, risk mitigation. We have also collaborated with UNECA in developing a manual for capturing informal cross-border trade data and in trade integrating the statistics of informal cross-border trade in formal statistics. This will help in increasing intra-African trade by capturing hitherto neglected cross-border trade statistics. In the area of trade information, we have developed the African Trade Observatory. It's a trade intelligence tool that is custom designed for the private sector and policymakers to identify trading opportunities across the continent and the rest of the world. And also it has other aspects of trade information, including a directorate of authorized economic operators. Trust in Africa is in huge deficit. Quite often, we hear of intra-African traders being swindled by what they thought were their trading partners. The directorate is going to remove that huge threat. But also, in collaboration with the OECD, establishing a platform on investment and productive transformation in Africa. The platform will aid in fast-tracking policy innovation as well as facilitating dialogue on issues affecting investment flows to Africa. With respect to manufacturing, we are planning to roll out the Made in Africa standard this year. In addition to promoting quality and originality, the standard will also remove technical barriers to trade in the marketplace of the African continental free area. Globally, manufacturing accounts for 52% of international trade. In the case of Africa, manufacturing accounts for 40 to 42% of the commodity composition of intra-African trade. Against this background, we, in collaboration with the International Trade Center, the European Union, GIZ of German, and UNIDO commissioned a value chain diagnostic study to identify sectors with huge potential for sustainable value chain development in Africa and the bottlenecks preventing businesses from fully realizing this potential. The study released last year mapped 5,300 products as inputs or outputs and identified 415 continental value chains. The sectors of pharmaceuticals, baby foods, apparel and textiles, as well as automobiles were identified as priority sectors for investment in the African continental free area. As climate change accelerates, critical minerals will play a pivotal role in the green transition. There is emerging consensus with cooperating partners that value addition in the green transition should be at source. This strategic position will boost Africa's industrialization, inter-African trade, and decent employment. In this connection, we'll be placing before the ministers responsible for mining this year an African critical minerals draft strategy. I'd like to make three points before I end the outline of our contribution in the implementation of the agreement and protocols of the African continent of Pretoria. The first one is that we have a broad and deep collaboration with African private sector organizations, such as the Pan-African Chambers of Commerce and Industry who are here, the Pan-African Manufacturers Association, I don't see them, and the African Business Council, which also, I don't see. This collaboration will further deepen and broaden as we mobilize the African private sector to participate in the G20 Business Summit. The second point is on governance. Here, the key point is that we are working with our colleagues on peace and security 
as well as the African Development Bank, to come up with a program on the next size, on the one hand of peace and security, and on the other hand of development and regional integration. The African Development Bank plans to use this program in coming up with security indexed bonds. At the same time, at the level of the African Union, we continue to impose sanctions where there is an constitutional changes of, of government. And through the Peace and Security Department, we also continue to monitor elections across Africa. The third point is that as we meet, the world is expected to go through increased fragmentation of international trade. The first driver of fragmentation of international trade in the recent past was the COVID-19 pandemic. It is now wars which are not only disrupting production, but also making the oceans and oceans unsafe thereby disrupting shipping lines. Against this backdrop of global supply chain disruption, the marketplace of the African continent of free trade area, with a population of 1.4 billion people, and is growing, can give us the shield we need to enhance domestic resource mobilization and domestic consumption and in the process, avoid recessions, but instead generate growth and resilience. Some parties call this strategic autonomy. And historically, domestic consumption has been a key driver of Africa's economic growth. As I move towards concluding, let me start that as part of the process of creating an AFCFTA implementation peer learning community. <clears throat> let us be pragmatic and also let us avoid being distracted in the implementation of the agreements and protocols of the African continent of Rotterdam. Adopting this mindset will give us strategic focus, tremendous consistency, dynamism, discipline, and a couch of high performance. With these assets, we should see ourselves generating high-impact results, evidenced by, among others, increased volumes and values of intra-African trade. I'll conclude by suggesting that in the second edition of the conference, we should request a member of the African private sector to deliver the keynote address so that we can hear from them there are lessons of experience in investing, producing, and trading in the African continent of retail area. And in the third edition, let us give the slot to a state part to the agreement of the African continent of retail area. Other stakeholders like the regional economic communities and civil society can be given similar placements in later editions. Such diverse of experiences and perspectives will become rich in knowledge and be better placed to move to higher levels of implementing the agreement establishing the African continent of Rotterdam. I'll end here and thank you for your kind attention. <laughs>